you would, find your way to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But thinking about Mother's Day, and it's, it's always, I love Mother's Day because I had a godly mom who prayed for me my entire life. She's praying for me this morning. And it, you know, when you have a mother that just displays their love for you, there's nothing like it. And I am not ashamed to tell you that I am one of the biggest mama's boys that was ever here. I love my mother. And as I was thinking about where God wanted me to go this morning as far as sermon material, um, he led me to 2 Timothy, and you'll, you'll figure that out in just a moment. But I was thinking about moms, and one mom came to my mind, and I remembered it from my church history class. But that mother is Susanna Wesley. Some of you may not know who Susanna Wesley was, but you can see the dates that she lived, 1662 to 1742. But she was the youngest of 25 children. And how many of you moms want a house full of 25? She was the youngest of 25. At the age of 19, she married Samuel Wesley, who was a pastor in the Church of England. Together, she and Samuel had 19 children. What about a family reunion that would look like, huh? 25 and then 19. But Susanna was a remarkable wife and mother. She was said to have, to have had a spreadsheet for her family before there was ever any such thing called a spreadsheet. Anyone who testified of her family said that the household was ran like the military. And I imagine with 19 kids in the house, you would have to have some kind of structure. But she held prayer meetings and Bible studies in her home for the ladies of the area. She ensured that when her husband was traveling and in his preaching, that the church did not go without. But one of the most remarkable things in her life that stand out to me over all of them was that Susanna Wesley carved out one hour per week per child for one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, just imagine what that would look like. You know, we only had one child, and finding one hour a week just to have a conversation with her wasn't real easy. But she carved one hour per week per child, per 19 children, to just pour into. Two of her children became quite famous, Charles and John Wesley. You may know those names from the Methodist Church, because John Wesley was the founder, and Charles Wesley helped him found the Methodist denomination. John became a preacher. John record, It was recorded that he traveled 250,000 miles preaching over 40,000 sermons in his ministry. I want you to think about that. Traveled over 250,000 miles, and those miles in his day were on horseback or his two feet. That equates to 10 times around the earth because the earth's diameter is just a little under 25,000 miles. Charles Wesley became, uh, became a songwriter. It was said that Charles Wesley wrote, wrote somewhere between 10 and 15 poetic lines per day for 50 years. He wrote... 8,989 hymns, 10 times that of Isaac Watt. Here are a few of the hymns that Charles Wesley wrote. And can it be, Christ the Lord is risen today. Come thou long expected Jesus. Here's one you'll know. Hark the herald angels sing. Jesus, lover of my soul, and my favorite hymn that he ever wrote was, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. The success and accomplishment of these two men for the kingdom of Christ rode solely on the skirt tail of Susanna Wesley and the life that she used to pour into and putting Jesus in front of each of those 19 children that God blessed her with. Mom, your role in the godly development of your children is priceless. And for that, I want to say thank you to our godly mothers. The title of today's message is just simply this, parents need to understand. Parents need to understand. And 
the title, you'll, 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 you'll pick up on it in just a minute. But if you found your way to 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 6 and 7, Paul is giving instruction to his son in the ministry. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So Paul is encouraging this young man. He's his son in the faith. He's encouraging, giving him these instructions. But if you go back and you start at the beginning of this chapter, we see some principles that Paul lays out that all of us as parents can understand. Notice you would in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, and, and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as I as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you well. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Pray with me as we move into this time together. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the day that is set aside to celebrate our mothers. Father, there is a room full of godly mothers that are represented here this morning. I pray a blessing over each one. Father, you have blessed us with a multitude of children in this church and in our, in our individual lives. And Father, they are a blessing from you. And I pray that as we go through the principles in your word this morning, Father, that you would let it just take root in our life, that we would see what we need to understand as parents. Bless this time as only you can. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Paul is writing to his son in the faith. Paul loved Timothy like his very own child. Paul raised him up in the ministry. Paul watched him grow into the pastor that he became. Paul wanted to make sure Timothy got what he needed to be successful in ministry. And folks, as parents, our, our goal and our, our, our uh, objective as parents is to see that our kids grow into something successful. But we need to make sure before any success in this world that they're successful for the kingdom of Christ. And that's what Paul was mentioning here to his son in the faith. What Paul is giving to Timothy, parents need to understand. So I'm just going to walk through some of these principles very quickly. But if you'll remember back several years ago, there was a song that was called Parents Just Don't Understand. And folks, I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you my worldly side here for just a second. It was by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, all right? Most of you know the Fresh Prince by Will Smith. But uh, they were singing this song, and it was, uh, they were on a shopping trip. I remember the video. It was hilarious. But he, he, mom was trying to buy school clothes, and she just didn't understand that she was messing up his reputation. And I love, the, I love this one line. Mom told him that, she doesn't, that he doesn't have a rep yet. All right? So parents just didn't understand about dressing those kids for school. But here's some things that parents need to understand. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot about this generation that I don't understand. There's a lot of things that I just don't get. All right, there's a lot of fashions that I don't understand. Some of the way that, some of the clothes that they wear, I mean, you know, when we were growing up, if you got a hole in the knee of your jeans, mom cut them off and you wore them as shorts for the next couple of years, right? Now you go to the store and you buy jeans that have holes in them. Just don't understand. There are trends that I don't understand. And one of the trends that I really don't get, and I may step on some toes here if there's any teenagers in here that have these kind of trucks, but all I know what to call them is the squatting dog truck. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. You understand, right? I don't understand why they want to do that. You got a truck where the front end, you can't even see over the hood, and the back end's almost dragging the ground. I just don't understand it. There are some things that kids say that they listen to, that they watch, that I just don't get. Each generation has things that the parents just don't understand. But there are six principles in these short verses that I gave you that we can understand these principles and we can ensure that our children are raised in a godly home. These principles are from a father to a son, but they point to the importance of a mother and a grandmother. 
And on Mother's Day, moms, you need to understand how vital your role is in forming these kids in a godly home. Paul was in prison in Rome, and he was missing his child in the faith, and he knew that he might never see Timothy again. And he loved Timothy so much that he wrote him to encourage him and to instruct him. And these are those principles that we find. Principle number one, parents need to understand children are a gift and a blessing from God. Say amen. Amen. They're a blessing from God. And so many people have had hard times having children. And you pray and you pray and you pray and finally that blessing comes. Children are a blessing from God. Paul, he was, you know, when you stop and think about this, Paul tells us in this passage, I was led by God to do what I did. Paul led Paul, or God led Paul all the way. Timothy was in Paul's life by the will of God. Your parents, we're parents because of the will of God. He chose to bless us with these children. Notice what it says here. According to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. We need to understand that children are a blessing and they're given to us from God above. And he gave you what he wanted you to have. This passage of scripture I shared with Corey and Carly this morning. I want to read it again. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with the enemy at the gate. Well, you think about filling a quiver 25 kids, 19 kids, but let me tell you something. If you've got one, you've got an arrow that needs to be shot straight. And the only way that arrow is shot straight is by raising them up in the admonition and the love for God. When our life is in Christ, that life must reflect to and on our children. Second principle is this. Parents need to understand what is best for our children. We want our children to have the best, amen? We want them to have what we didn't have. There's a lot of things I didn't have when I was growing up that I wanted to make sure my daughter got to enjoy that. You know, and so we want our children to have the best, but look at the best that Paul tells here, the principle that Paul gives about giving children the best. Notice in the last part of verse two, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul said, Timothy, I want you to have the best. And this is the best, grace, mercy, and peace. Folks, stuff isn't always the best thing to give them. Things aren't always the best thing to give them. Money's not always the best thing to give them. But if they have the grace, the peace, and the mercy that comes from God above, they've got everything they need to survive this life and into eternity. That's the best that we can give them. We want our kids to have stuff. We want to have the best schools. We want to have the best clothes. But that's all temporal, and it won't last forever. The ultimate best is to give them Jesus. When we give our children Jesus, and I promise you, as long as I'm here at Bethel and as long as we have any kind of children's activities, they're going to leave knowing about Jesus. Amen, church? We put Jesus in front of them, but it starts at home. The church only has them for a short period of time. So parents, it's our job in the house to make sure that we put Jesus in front of them. What Paul wanted for Timothy, we need to want for our children. Notice this. He said, I want you to have grace, saved by grace, saved by the unmerited favor of God. If you've experienced that in your life, you you want your children to have it. He said, I want them to have mercy. And that's being delivered from the misery that's caused by a life of sinfulness. I don't want my children to have to go through some of the things that I went through. Because I went through them, I want to rescue them from that. And that's showing them the mercy that only comes from Jesus. I want them to have peace. We all need our children to have peace. That true peace that can only come from understanding and accepting God's grace and God's mercy. This world will not give your children any peace. And that's a promise, church. Grace and mercy bring peace. A miserable life is a life that never experiences the grace and mercy that's found in Christ Jesus. We need our children. We want our children to have that. What parent wouldn't want their child to experience Jesus? 
What parent wouldn't want their child to live forever because of faith in Christ? If you never give them anything other than Jesus, give them all the Jesus you can give them. A dear friend of mine who has a quiver full of kids said this, I'd rather have a child with an incurable disease and know that they know Jesus than to have a healthy child and wonder where they'll spend eternity. Our, our daughter was born with cystic fibrosis, and he was referring to that, and he was referring to the testimony that Amy had of her love for Christ. And he said, I would rather my kid be sick and can't get over it but know Jesus than to have a house full that, know, that are healthy but don't know Jesus. Folks, if we don't give our kid anything, we need to give them Jesus. Third principle we see in our passage this morning is parents need to understand to be thankful for their children. Notice what Paul said in the first part of verse 3. He said, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience. Paul said, Timothy, I am thankful for you. Paul was thankful for Timothy. Timothy was thankful for Paul. Timothy was a blessing to Paul, and Paul was a blessing to Timothy. Paul wanted Timothy to know how much he was thankful for him. Paul says, my conscience is clear. Because of what he was doing for God, he knew he was giving to Timothy, and Timothy was taking it forward, and he loved Timothy, and he wanted Timothy to know how much he loved him. Parents, how often do we tell our children, I thank God for you. God gave you to me, and I'm thankful that he gave you to me. How often do we let them know that? How, do they understand that? Do we share with them how much we appreciate the blessing that they are in our lives? I heard a father say this with my own ears, and it hurt me clean to the bone. I don't know why we had you. You've been nothing but trouble since the day you came into the world. That child was a problem. That child was having problems, but no father should ever, no mother should ever tell their kids they're not a blessing. Even if they're going through the hardest time in life, God blessed them and gave them to you because he knew that you could handle what they were going through. Paul wanted Timothy to know, you're a blessing. You're a blessing. Here's the fourth principle. Notice the last part of verse 3. Parents need to understand we must pray for our children. Notice what Paul said, as I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. Now, Paul wasn't being redundant there because he, he, he prays for you constantly. He prays for you day and night. Aren't those the same things? What Paul was doing was emphasizing to Timothy, man, if nobody's praying for you, I'm praying for you. I got news for you. I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for a praying mother. There's many that wouldn't be where you are if it wasn't for a praying mother. Mothers who prayed us through some hard times. And Paul was telling his son in the faith, I'm praying for you. I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you constantly. I'm praying for you day and night. You're covered in prayer. And folks, we need to cover our children in prayer. If there's never been a time that they need it more, it's right now. Folks, we send our kids into a world that is decaying with sin every single day. And they need to be covered in our prayers. How are some ways we can pray for them? I'm glad you asked. Here's some right here. Pray for them to be saved. Romans 10.1. Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. He said, it's my harsh desire and it's my prayer for them. He was talking about his kinsmen, that they be saved. We need to pray that prayer over our children. God, it's my prayer that they be saved. That's the first prayer we need to pray. Another one is we need to pray the armor of God over them. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Just, just simply walk through that armor of God. Make sure that when they leave the house in the morning, that they're covered with the armor of God, that they can withstand whatever Satan's going to throw at them that day. We need to pray for them to have godly friends. Folks, let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that bad company corrupts good character. And if our kids get involved with the wrong group of people, they're not going to pull them up to their level. That bad group's going to pull them down to theirs. 
We need to pray that God gives them godly influences in their life. We need to pray for them to be witnesses to their friends. We need to pray for their future spouse. The one that God's going to send to them, that they're going to spend their life with, that's a godly person. We need to pray for them to live for Jesus. The list could go on and on and on. But parents, I, I want to ask you this question. How serious are we about praying for our children? Paul told Timothy, buddy, I pray for you constantly. I pray for you night and day, meaning every time your, your name comes to my mind, I'm, I'm covering you in prayer. Folks, what better thing can we give our children than prayers to the Almighty? Next to the last principle, notice in verse 4, parents need to understand it's okay to show our emotions and our affections to our children. Paul said, as I remember your tears, Paul understood that when he last saw Timothy, both of them left crying. Paul was sad because he was in jail. Timothy was sad because he wasn't able to stay with Paul. He had to get back and do what he was doing. Timothy's tears were most likely because he had to leave Paul. Paul's tears was because he had to watch Timothy walk away. And so when you stop and think about that, it's okay for us to let our affections be known to our children. Now, I was raised by a godly father, father who pastored all of my formative years, was in missions the last 20-plus years of his life, godly man. But my dad was one of those guys that grew up on a farm in middle Georgia, and if you fell off your bicycle and you broke your wrist, you broke your elbow, you broke your collarbone, you broke your ankle all in one wreck, he'd say, rub dirt on it and get over it. All right, just tough, you know, be tough. But folks, when it comes to our children, there is absolutely nothing wrong with letting them see us shed tears. Our face, it could be tears of joy, it could be tears of sadness. I remember the first time I saw my father cry in front of me was because of something stupid that I had done, and I'll never get that image out of my mind because I knew I broke his heart. And folks, when we show our emotions, our kids understand, hey, these folks are real. They're not some you know, Superman or Superwoman, they're showing their emotions. Don't be afraid to tell them and don't be afraid to show them how you feel. Hug them as often as you can. Don't be afraid to let them see you cry. The last principle I want to share with you this morning as we wrap up is this. Parents need to understand our faith will be what builds their faith. Notice verse five. I'm reminded of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Paul said, Timothy, you got a good foundation. You had a godly mom and you had a godly grandmother. Now, chances are in history tells us that Timothy's dad was, was not a believer, that he was a Greek by, by birth. And so, Timothy's dad was probably not even in the picture. He said, if your mom and your grandma want to do all this crazy Jesus stuff, that's fine, but it's not for me. So Timothy was watching his mother and his grandmother. Folks, I'm here to tell you, your children are watching every move you make. Your grandchildren are watching every move you make. And let me tell you, if we're not moving toward Jesus, they're watching. And we need to make sure they see us moving toward Jesus. They're going to imitate us. As we have, if we have Christ as the priority in their life, Christ will be the priority in their life. They'll see that Jesus means something. Church means something. Growing in the grace and the knowledge of God's word means something. And so we need to demonstrate that. Timothy saw that in his grandmother and in his mom. He was watching. But if we play around with our church attendance, if we play around with our Bible reading and our Bible study, if we play around with Jesus, they're going to see that. One of the saddest things that I've heard, I think, in ministry was a mom told me, she said, I'm having a hard time getting my son to come to church. She and her daughter came to church, but she said, I'm having a hard time getting my son to come to church because he knows that his dad is going to go fishing or going to play golf on Sunday, and now that he's old enough, he wants to hang around with dad. Folks, may that never be said of a godly, per of a godly parent. We need to show our kids how important Jesus is in our life. Remember, we don't have to teach our children sin. A lot of times, you think about it, we're all born with a sin nature. We don't have to teach them how to be bad. If you don't believe me, 
Evie is the newest one born into our faith family. Bless her heart. That is a beautiful child. Amen? <laughs> She'll lie. She'll lie and she can't even walk or talk. Because she knows that if she screams to the top of her lungs, even if she's not hungry, mom and daddy's going to come get her, and then she'll smile at them. We don't have to teach our children how to sin. We need to teach them about Jesus. We need to teach them what's right. We need to show them that we love the church, that we love Jesus. The way we do that is by showing them our life, by living by example, keeping God as a central figure in our life and in our family. Bodie Bauckham says this, and I love it. It's a great quote. He says, God has not left us to wander aimlessly in the wilderness as we raise our children. He has given us a blueprint for multigenerational faithfulness. That blueprint is expressed throughout the Bible, but there's one place where it reads like a how-to manual, and that place is Deuteronomy 6. The kids just sang Deuteronomy 6, 5 a few minutes ago. But I want you to hear Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 as we close. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on the gates. Folks, when it comes to living godly, when it comes to living for Jesus, we got the manual, but we need to live it out. Keep it in front of your kids. Show them how important it is. It, it, when they're lying down, when they're standing up, that means all the day long, even at night, put Jesus in front of your kids. That's how important it is. 